The UK will probably have a general election sometime this year, but we still don't know when, so why not? I have friends who are aristocrats, I have friends who are upper class, I have friends who are, you know, working class, but I'm not working class. Okay, changing what, the things what is that, that need vision? changing, what and is that, that is the change that I will bring about. And for us, our heirs and successors, to appoint, give and grant unto him the said name, state, degree, style, dignity, title and honour of Baron Cameron of Chipping Norton. So what's happened to that twat David Cameron oh. who called it on? Let's be fair. Oh. I think what? you're referring no, to no, our no, former no, Prime no. Minister. Yeah, but why the, how comes he can scuttle off? He called all this on. Yeah. yeah he has no regrets. Where's, where is he? He's in Europe, in Nice, with his trotters up. Yeah? Where is the geezer? I think he should be held accountable for it. You know what? What? He should be held you know accountable for it. It's a valid point. A lot of people do feel... Twat. That, that... Oh, God, I hate it. Oh, it's going everywhere. It's so nobody got to try. So one of these things that not that many people know about me, so I collect Coca-Cola things. Oh, oh really? Yeah, yeah, I'm a Coke oh. addict. Oh, I'm a total Coke sick. addict. Fuck off. Welcome, Marks and Marquettes, once again to another season of the Ultimate Knockdown Dragout Fight Tournament. The UK's 2024 general election, or uh, 2025 general election. Seriously, no one knows when it's going to be. Doesn't that seem odd? Shouldn't that be something we should schedule, you know, ahead of time, so... Featuring some of the all-time heavy hitters. In the red corner, he's the child-starving, compulsively lying, Thatcher-praising Labour leader with a face like an overripe ham. It's the bookie's favourite, Kia Pledge Breaker Starmer! Fuck off. That's right, sports fans. This man is almost guaranteed to be the next Prime Minister by having alienated almost his entire base. He's going to have to rely on the entire electorate staying at home to secure his win by default. Speaking of which, in the blue corner, weighing seven and a half pounds and worth seven and a half million pounds, he's the Conservative Party hopeful, so unelectable, he lost in a head to head with Liz Pork Markets Trust. He's the man the BBC drew in a Superman costume to bolster his public image while he sent millions of Britons out to die from a plague. He's the only man on the planet with low enough charisma to make Keir Starmer seem interesting. It's the one, the only, Conservative leader and the long shot if you're taking bets. Rishi, by default, Sunak! Woo! So yeah, Dan, blow the air horns. Yeah, get the air... The air horn th there at the back. Yep, yeah, behind Graham. <laughs> Careful with that. There we go. There we go. Woo! So, who should you vote for come election day? Which one of these astonishing figures is capturing your attention? Well, it had better be one or the other, because despite Tony Blair promising to change Britain's voting system to proportional representation in 1997, he never did. So we're stuck with the first-past-the-post system, one of the most unfair and undemocratic methods of electing your leaders you could possibly want. And the only way to make this country's electoral system look even worse would be to have some sort of chamber that's entirely unelected, made of, like, literally landed gentry or something. <laughs> Bishops, I guess. Oh, uh, we we have that. That's called the House of Lords. Well, at least we don't have a king ruling over us, like with some sort of medieval relic. Uh, well, at least he has no power, even if there have been multiple stories over the last couple of decades about him and his mother personally interfering in the lawmaking process and politicking around their pet subjects. So, uh, I guess uh, that's not ideal. But in any case, viewers, no one but Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak two of the most unpopular and uninspiring people to ever set foot on the planet can possibly be elected Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. You could vote for the Liberal Democrats, the Green Party, but you know that under our current system, they could get millions of votes nationwide and still not get a single MP. Don't let that stop you voting for them, but if we're honest, it does discourage you from voting your heart, innit? Instead of out of fear of what five more years of Tory rule will bring us. So, what's the alternative? You see, the bookie's favourite, Keir Starmer. And that means exactly the same as the Conservatives, but more efficient. Air horns again, Dan. Fucking yeah. If you are a Conservative voter who despairs of this, if you feel our country needs a party that conserves, that fights for our union, our environment, the rule of law, 
family life, the, the careful bond between this generation and the next, then let me tell you, Britain already has one, and you can join it. It's this Labour Party. What exactly is this fucking island? Who, who came up with this system? Dan, did you come up with it? I, uh, I, I mean, all of that coming up on this year or possibly next year's season of WWE Westminster Wanker Elections. Choose your wanker now on our official sponsor, BetNonce. With BetNonce, you can dump all the money you don't have betting on a political leader who will do his level best to make the lives of you and your loved ones worse and worse forever and ever until you die. After which your children, due to the terms and conditions of Betnant, will be fostered by His Royal Highness Prince Andrew. Air horns again, Dan. Fuck yeah. So, uh, <coughs> what the fuck was that about? Hi, I'm Bridget Empire, science and culture correspondent for the official newspaper of the upcoming British general election, the Daily Telegraph. Just like the election, we're fictional, we might make a material difference in your life, and we'll leave you depressed and wishing you moved to Ireland when you had the chance. Today, I'm here to talk about Britain. Is it a democracy? From that introduction, you might think the answer to that is... 1. Yes, because there are elections. 2. No because you barely have any say in those elections, or three, sort of. And much like the pretentious asshole at every house party, I'm here to talk to you about why the answer is all of the above and also no, but yes, but no. Because the fact is democracy isn't just a switch you turn on and off. There are ways to make a society more democratic and less. Right now, the UK is less democratic than say, Germany, the USA, Cuba, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Norway, Australia, Macedonia, Serbia, Montenegro, Greece, and some medium-sized corporations. But there are elements of democracy in there, such as choosing between which overlord you want in charge of you, Red Tory or Blue Tory. Granted, you probably didn't choose either of them. You couldn't have chosen Rishi Sunak because no one elected him. He was the only candidate put forward by the Conservative Party in their last leadership election. After he suffered a humiliating loss to record-breakingly shit disgrace merchant Liz Truss, My mother took me on protests. I went on marches. I made banners. In what should have been the most embarrassing moment of his career, if it weren't for, you know, all the other stuff he's done since. And while some people did actually vote for Keir Starmer as Labour Party leader, not me, I voted for Rebecca Long Bailey, thank you very much, that being the membership of the Labour Party, that's only a subsection of the total electorate. And people voted on him based on a lie he sold the party, that he would be doing, as people like to say at the time, Corbynism without Corbyn. Promising socialist domestic policies, but presented by someone who looks like that supply teacher your class bullied out of school after a particularly shit maths lesson. He has, since, broken every one of the 10 pledges he was elected on, and then changed the rules of the Labour Party to take away pretty much every avenue for member democracy within. So, uh, I guess he's your best hope? We'll go over it. So, is the UK a democracy? Well, let's look at the major parties, the system of government, and the titular K in UK, the King. And then we'll see how we're feeling at the end. Because as much as the UK is at like a three, where an ideal democracy, even in our current system, would be at a hundred, it could still be worse. Boy, this country could be depressing, huh? But you may be asking right now, hey, Bridget Empire, super cool and sexy transgender weirdo from fake and gay newspaper, The Daily Telegraph, what are you doing on a video about how Britain falls short on being a proper democracy when the next election hasn't even been announced yet? What does it matter? Well, this is why I'm doing it. It is the 12th of January, 2024. I wake up to news that at the whim of the unelected Prime Minister of the UK, Rishi Sunak, without parliamentary approval, but with the unequivocal support of Keir Starmer, the leader of the opposition, who is elected based on a platform of lies, the UK is bombing Yemen. For what crime, you might ask? For blocking shipping lanes in the Red Sea in an attempt to force an end to the genocide of Palestinians. In the wake of this, and to be honest, Half the insane news you hear from Normal Island these days, 
you might well ask, who voted for this? The answer? No one. But if that's the case, that raises an important question, especially since 2024 will more than likely be an election year. Is Britain a democracy? Can any of us have a meaningful say in who the people are who sit in a dark room and decide unilaterally to do horrific things in our name? And more importantly, can we stop it? I love democracy. I love the Republic. First things first, let's take a look at the parliamentary system we have in place to change, well, anything in this country. While executive decisions are made largely at the discretion of the Prime Minister and their cabinet, as in the horrific case I just mentioned, and in the case of, say, everything to do with the UK's war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan, the coups they participated in over the decades, and all of that stuff we the public aren't privy to, the Prime Minister and their cabinet are, as you might expect, the leader of the largest party in the parliament, i.e. the party with the most seats, not necessarily the most votes. That's important, and we'll get to that. Plus, they're appointees, usually members of the same party unless they're in a coalition government. To form a government, they need to get approval from the monarchy, so some old fucker sitting in a big golden chair has to give permission for even the sliver of actual democracy we have in this country. Great! I'm glad we still have complete faith in the monarchy not to intervene in any of this. It's not like a member of the royal family was involved in a potential coup against the Labour Prime Minister in the past 50 years, or that one was literally in cahoots with Adolf Hitler to become Prime Minister in an occupied Britain. Oh, wait, that, that did actually all happen. Anyway, the party with the most seats in the House of Commons forms the government. But there's a secondary house in the UK, and while many countries have this, like the United States as a house and a senate, the UK second chamber is entirely unelected. So while yes, the US system where each state gets two senate members despite its population is terrible, the UK, as always, somehow manages to do one worse. The House of Lords, as our second chamber is known, is comprised of literal landed gentry, aristocrats, appointees from parliamentarians, from former politicians to entertainers, to the host of the British version of The Apprentice, and a bunch of bishops from the Church of England. So just so you know, there is no separation of church and state, despite Britain being a pretty secular country by the standards of the religiosity of its population. But you could have guessed that from the monarch both being head of the church and head of state. Now, you might like the House of Lords. I don't know why you would, but you could argue that it's necessary to have a second chamber to keep the first chamber in check, which is an opinion you could have, but you can't argue that it's democratic. Not a single person votes for these people. Speaking of no one voting for these people, Rishi Sunak is our current Prime Minister by default. Our last general election returned a government run by Boris Johnson, the Conservative leader at the time, who, after causing hundreds of thousands of deaths during the pandemic, got ousted by his own party and replaced by Liz Truss, who was voted in not by the general public, but by Tory members. So that's not very democratic, but at least some people got to vote. Well, wouldn't you believe that she was chosen over Rishi Sunak because every member of the Tory party has the brain capacity of a ringed out sponge. And so when she became prime minister and promptly killed the queen and crashed the economy within literally a couple of weeks, she was forced to resign. And the Tory party senior figures made sure no democracy would possibly happen in finding her replacement as every potential Tory leader dropped out before a race could be announced. And Rishi Sunak won by default. Not even voted on by Tory members. Now, to be fair, to be in running for the leader, you do have to get nominations from MPs. But if we're counting that as democracy, then the word starts to lose any of its meaning. A group of posh twats handpicked by the Tory leadership to be the only candidates on the ballot for their party, with no input from the public, choosing the leader of a country of almost 70 million people, does not a democracy make. And that brings us to how candidates get selected in the first place. You see, in Britain, there are no open primaries like there are in the US. How convenient! So how do you pick the candidates that you can vote for come a general election? Well, you don't. The Tory party upper management approved candidates to parachute into your local area to vote for, and Labour, well, Labour does the same thing now, but it's not supposed to, and it didn't used to. A few years ago, Labour members could apply to their local Labour parties, or CLPs, to become Labour candidates. The local party would shortlist the candidates, give them space to talk to the local party and make the case, and then the local party would vote on which candidate they would put forward. This is when there was an opening. To get rid of a sitting MP, a local party would need to deselect them, which is incredibly difficult. And one of the reasons, one of the talking points around the Corbyn period was implementing open deselection so you can get rid of right-wing MPs that are just entrenched there. But at least there's some element of choice, right? Well, then we got a new Labour leader, Sir Kid Starver, and he didn't like the fact that local parties sometimes voted in candidates that disagreed with them. And that's a problem, 
Because as we know now, and as he was lying about then, Keir Starmer wants to run a Margaret Thatcher tribute act, based on austerity, continuing the privatisation of the NHS, and making sure trans people all get in the bin. All policies that aren't just unpopular with Labour members, which they are, but with the general public. Even most Tory voters, when polled, are in favour of ending privatisation in the NHS, socialisation of rail, water and electric utilities, and ending austerity. So, if democracy was at work here, that wouldn't be very good for our boy Keith here. So, over the last few years of his leadership, he's worked on deselecting MPs from the top down if he considers them too far left, personally intervening in selections to remove candidates he doesn't like from long and short lists, personally replacing the supposedly democratically elected Scottish and Welsh Labour leaders with figures more loyal to him and his faction, overriding decisions democratically made by the Scottish Labour Party in favour of his own, and rigging elections using a faulty online voting system with dodgy connections to his second in command. In fact, Starmer's Labour has been directly accused of voter fraud by its own MPs. To quote, ugh, Dan, really? Fine. The Telegraph. I'm watching you, Alternate Universe, Bridget Empire. I will end you if you come for me and my team of cursed satanic editors. I worked too long and too hard to have my life ended by a- Lawyers acting for Sam Tarry, the MP for Ilford South, have written to the party over claims that an online voting system has been used to disadvantage left-wing candidates. Mr. Terry, whose relationship with Labour's deputy leader ended last year, claims the Anonia voter system was used to harm his unsuccessful attempt to be reselected for the general election. Anonia voter is a software for holding online votes that is widely used by local Labour Party branches to decide who will be their candidate for the next election. He has now considered issuing legal proceedings to force Labour to publish the Anonia voter records from a selection or even to get an injunction to block Mr. Athwal from being the official Ilford South candidate. Trade unions are helping Mr. Terry raise tens of thousands of pounds which will help fund legal action if an agreement within the party is not reached. Meanwhile, a second Labour MP, Beth Winter, who represents Sinon Valley, has been exchanging legal letters with the party over how an honour voter was used in her selection race. Miss Winter sought to become the candidate in a newly created Welsh seat last summer, but lost. Her lawyers wrote to the party raising concerns about the use of the honour voter system, both before and after the results. That's probably Kenan Valley. Sorry, Welsh speakers. I, I don't know how to pronounce Welsh. Vote breakdowns seen by The Telegraph showed that both candidates did better than their rivals among the voters who took part, either in person or by post, but worse among those who cast their ballot on another voter. Such records are not made public. Since becoming Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer has widely been seen to have sidelined left-wing figures. His party is now facing allegations that information generated by the Anoni voter system is being used at times to help get moderates selected as election candidates. In one selection, a moderate candidate won just 10% of the in-person vote, but 62% of the anonymous voter online vote, according to a breakdown shared by local party figures. This news comes as the Metropolitan Police this week confirmed its cyber team was investigating computer misuse in the selection of a Labour candidate in Croydon East after claims of vote rigging. And if you wanted to replace Starmer for lying about his platform, breaking all of his promises, and running a Labour party so heavy-handed from the top down that he would make Joseph Stalin blush, well, too bad. Because once he got in, he changed the way Labour leadership elections work to make them less democratic. He increased the number of MPs needed to nominate potential leaders, encouraged members to leave in droves, and purged left-wing factions from the party over false pretenses so that they couldn't vote, and even kicked out his predecessor, the only man to ever give me and a lot of my generation hope for this godforsaken country, Jeremy Corbyn, out of the party, so he'd never be able to challenge him for the leadership. So you can't choose the candidates you're voting for. Okay, that's not ideal. But at least you can choose which of these pre-selected briefcase schools will be representing you at the national level, right? Well, yeah, kind of, ish. So I mentioned the 2019 election earlier. Let's use that as a case study. While the media, and most people, frame British elections as a choice between two prime ministers, it is and it isn't that. Different boroughs vote on who will represent them at parliament by voting for the local MP in the form of voting for the Tory they didn't have a say in, the Labour candidate they didn't have a say in, or the Lib Dem, Green, SNP, or whatever the name the far-right party has now candidate, or any other candidates from smaller parties or independents. Whichever party gets the most votes in that borough wins the seat, and all the other votes for all the other parties just vanish into the ether. And then, whichever party returns the most MPs based on this goes to the big rich bastard wearing stolen gold and asks to form a government, to which the bastard presumably replies, why not? Now fuck off, I'm trying to cure my ass cancer with sugar pills and ground up nettles. In the 2019 election, this is how many thousands of votes the biggest parties got. So one vote here equals a thousand votes. Got it? Good. Okay. So the Conservatives got 13,966 votes. The Labour Party got 10,269 votes. The Lib Dems got 3,696 votes. The SNP got 1,242 votes. 
and the Greens got 866 votes. Now, just to give you a snapshot of how fucked up our voting system, first past the post is, you'll notice that the Greens got over half as many votes as the SNP. So you'd expect them to win over half the number of seats as the SNP, right? Well, because of our voting system, it doesn't matter how many votes you got. Whoever has the most votes in each borough wins, and all the rest of the votes just don't count for shit. Because the Green Party votes are spread throughout the entire country, and the SNP, being the Scottish National Party, only got votes in Scotland, the concentration of their votes in each seat selection is higher. So the Greens got one seat, but the SNP didn't get two seats, they got 48 seats. Do you see how this might start to be a problem? But this problem gets worse than that. You see, in the 2017 election, Labour came within 2,000 votes of a majority. But the result of that missing 2,000 votes was a Tory minority government, because not all votes translate into seats. This system isn't natural or inevitable. There are already established, time-tested, more equitable voting systems available. I'm not even talking about socialist experiments or horizontal organising, even just in other liberal democracies in the West. In Australia, they have a single transferable vote system, where if your first choice of candidate is knocked out of the race, your vote goes to your second choice. Across Europe, there are a bunch of different proportional representation systems, where your votes, in a shocking twist, actually translate into representation in Parliament. And these are just ways to do representative systems more fairly. This isn't even broaching the idea of introducing more direct democracy, which is more and more possible now that we have the technology needed for instant communication, or doing away with parties altogether. A lot of the top-down decisions that make it nigh impossible for anyone who didn't go to Eton and then Oxford to get into Parliament could be done away by removing party politics from the equation and voting on individual candidates. Then you get to vote based on what individual people say and do. Imagine, instead of what colour their name is printed next to, and then getting surprised when they don't actually represent you in Parliament. Which is how Cuba's National Assembly, which runs the Cuban state, works. And it's not like we never voted for this option either, in the only way we can. Tony Blair promised voting reform when he was first elected, and he never delivered it. He was in power for 10 years, he had plenty of time to do it. This is the same play Justin Trudeau made in Canada. There was a referendum on an alternative voting system about a decade ago, but that was a watered-down half-measure with a smear disinformation campaign set up to encourage a no vote, despite the Liberal Democrats having, again, only become powerful enough to become coalition partners with the Tories based on promising voting reform. Not based on promising a referendum for voting reform. Not only that, but all three of the big parties, also once upon a time, in 2010, had reform in the House of Lords in their manifesto. What changed, guys? But just for a second say, we adopted proportional representation. Would the UK be a democracy then? Well, it would be more democratic than it is now. There are some easy things you could do right now to make this country more democratic, including implementing a proportional voting system that makes seats in line with people who vote rather than lines on a map, in addition to getting rid of unfair boundary changes, being allowed to add multiple Tory MPs by default, and one that educates people on candidates before going into the voting booth so they're not just left to decide on a candidate based on the logo next to their name. You could even make election day a national holiday. Make sure people have time to vote, get rid of the recently implemented voter ID laws, and make it easier for normal people to get involved with politics by taking needing funding out of the equation and offering support for people who want to give it a shot but don't have the cash or connections to leave their job for months to run a campaign. You could also, to make this even better, have open primaries like they have in the US, so we can actually vote on who's representing us. To make this proper attempt at making Britain an actual democracy, you'd have to abolish the House of Lords. And if we're being honest with ourselves, abolish the monarchy. However much their role is largely ceremonial, they still have undue power and influence, and that's been established acutely in the case of our current king. This would still be representative democracy though, so you could still improve on this. Make all candidates instantly recallable, for example, so that they're always answerable to their constituents. Or, if you want to be even fairer, make it so their only job is to communicate the decisions of their constituents. Have all constituents vote in assemblies or something similar, on anything they want to, and have the representative only exist to communicate that voice without speaking for them or speaking over them, as the untouchable representatives on our current system do. Voting for measures that are wildly unpopular with their constituents with no consequences and no way to be reined in. You could do this on the national level, by taking every parliamentary decision to the people. So instead of a second chamber consisting of unelected barons and marquesses deciding if a law gets to pass, every decision could go to the people. Let them decide. This was harder to do a few hundred years ago, but it's a piece of piss now. So if we did all that, the UK would be more democratic.
But could it be even more democratic than that? Well, there's one important thing we haven't talked about here. So many of us take for granted that for the majority of our days, we are bound by a system in which we have no say. No ability to make changes and are ruled from above by a dictator who tells us we must be thankful for the ability to be ruled over them. No, I'm not talking about the monarchy. I'm talking about the workplace. Without workplace democracy, you can make reform after reform and still live under a dictatorship for most of your day. If you work for, say, Tesco, if the CEO of Tesco decides your shop needs to be closed or a thousand people need to be fired, you don't get to say no. You just have to take it. But why? Why should a guy who's never set foot in a supermarket in their life get to dictate how you live, get to decide whether you get to eat or starve, whether you live in a house or end up homeless? Why should your boss get to be a dictator when we as a society have collectively agreed that dictators should be a thing of the past? Why shouldn't the people who actually work at these places decide how they're run? Why should a guy a thousand miles away with a private jet get to decide whether you can pay your rent each month when you make all of the money for him. All of that wealth is being created by you and by other workers. He's not doing anything. At a certain point, when you start asking the question, how do we make this country more democratic? You're going to have to move past the boundaries of what is possible under capitalism because you can't have a true democracy without workers owning the means of production. For a society to be truly democratic, it needs socialism. So when you're wondering why voting reforms aren't made, why draconian institutions like the House of Lords and the monarchy stay standing while millions starve in the streets, why every election the most arrogant ghouls find that votes for them are worth tens of thousands more than votes for anyone who might stand a chance of changing things for the better, this isn't an accident. Our democracy is being held back on purpose because the people in charge know that more democracy is bad for their interests. More democracy means more power for the very people they need to be on the edge of homelessness, of starvation, forced to work to survive in jobs they never would have chosen if they had options like Tory MPs do. This is deliberate, but we can change it. But we probably can't do it at the voting booth this election, unless something absolutely bananas happens in the next six months, like an actual socialist party emerges and starts polling better than the big two parties, or the Tories go full joker mode and enact PR at the last minute to prevent Labour from winning by default. So for now, protest, speak out, let your demands be known, and I guess vote Green? I mean, they're the most viable left-wing option now that Labour's back to being diet Tory. They won't win a majority, but they might swing a couple of constituencies, and even a rise in their vote share might let some of the right people know that the appetite is there for actual change. Labour are pretty much guaranteed to win at this point because the Tories have completely imploded. In fact, senior figures in the Conservative Party have been quoted saying the Tories will split in two after the election. So there's no harm in voting for a smaller party. In fact, right now, it's necessary because the bigger the Labour vote share under Keir Starmer, the more he's going to take that as an active endorsement of his platform of austerity, of social and economic conservatism in a red tie. But remember, the real goal isn't a green majority, even though that would be much better than our current options. Our aim has to be a world where people have a real and decisive say in how to live their lives. Where we live for ourselves, not for any king, not for any CEO, but where we actually get to decide how we live. Until then, keep up the good fight. And thanks for watching. Hey, thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. If you like this video, oh Jesus, if you like this video, why not like it, leave a comment, subscribe, and tell all of your friends about it. I am quite poor right now, as always, so if you have a few coins but in a hole in your pocket and you hate to see a tram like me down on her luck, why not give me some arms for the poor and send me some money? You can give one-time donations on Coffee or PayPal, links below, as always, or better yet, send it to my Patreon, where you get early videos, access to the members only Discord, my Nintendo Switch friend code, and exclusive content such as long-form interviews with Princess Weeks, Rosenkreutz, and Jesse Chedder. In addition to all that good stuff, you'll also, if you sign up, get your name read out at the end of each video, just like these lovely people. Sarah Rudston, Jason Hay. Frank McManus, Susan Foster, Helena, Sierra Whiskey, Orestria, 
Alipatko, Brian, John N, Scully, Jan, Lloyd Luciente, Jason Crivet, Shield Vaden, Robin Podolsky, Exploding Turtle, Casual Observer, Terry Roberts, Manta Ray, Courtney Burmack, Sleepy Slug, Philip Zabrobe, Soma Piglet, Brain Douche, Artie Wolf, Hayden Gaylor, Greg Noble, Deanna McMillan, Caroline Regalado, Alexandra Lilly, PJ Lisbrell, Howard Lotz, Lara Van Lunera, Nia Scotia, and Joey Cobalt. Thank you all, and viva the revolution? I, I guess? <laughs>